yeah, there was this person who commented on it, and they're all like, basically said some snide thing about imagine defending a book that's to a thousand years old, and they mm -hmm. go on this little rant, and I was, and I was trying to re to reply, and I was like, there's no point to this, delete, mm -hmm. and then I just deleted their comment. I was <laughs> like, this is this is gonna go nowhere. Obviously, like he's not, the person was just coming in hot, you know. Right. One thing that I've learned as I've gotten older is I don't have to. I don't have to attend every argument I'm invited to. <laughs> that has been world changing for me. <laughs> I'm still getting used to not arguing back with people on the internet. It's just stupid hard. And pointless. It's hard. I'm like, should I make it? No, I feel like want to though, but I shouldn't. I do a lot of typing now. Mm -hmm. Deleting it. <sighs> I just delete it. This is gonna make more problems anyway. Yeah. No. The only time I leave it is if I feel like it's absolutely necessary. Right. Because, not because the person's going to listen, but because of other people reading it as well. Well, look, my math professor. Your what professor? Some, my math professor. Okay. He had made some moot comment about, I told him that there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, look, if I don't get caught up, I'm sorry. But I need to be there for my family. Yeah. He's like, well, then you shouldn't be in college then. I was like, don't comment, don't comment. That's about the stupidest thing you could have said. And he's been there though. He's like, yeah, I've been through that, but you just you push through. I'm like, I'm a, I'm two weeks behind. No, <laughs> I understand. I understand. You know, needing to push through stuff and whatnot. Right. But at the end of the day, you do have to realize that you don't live forever. But Your family, you don't know how long you have them for. Right, because we didn't know if my dad was going to wake up. I dropped out of uh, I dropped out of grad school this semester, and I just got in. I was really excited for it because I, I was thinking about it. And I was thinking, look, I'm all stressed, so my work's not going to be that great. Right. And then my kids need me, and my right. wife needs me. I need I need to. I'm not going to be able to have you know time for this and this and this. And, no. Right. Grad school was the extra time. But now that I have medical things that are taking up extra time, I can't do two you extra. Can't have all that extra time. Right. I only had enough for one extra thing. Now the medical thing is the extra thing. So hopefully I get that resolved. If I do, well then we go back to grad school. Sure. Like you and Pastor are always saying. <laughs> right. There's only 24 hours in a day. You can't make it 20 for that one. I mean it's true. I was like, oh, I needed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I got two weeks worth of school done in four and a half hours. Wow. I pushed through hard. That was hard. But I wanted to be done with it. Well, well you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so last week, um, or I guess you'd say two weeks ago, uh, we started talking about contradictions in the Gospels, but we, we, we didn't actually talk about any of the contradictions. We just kind of laid out the foundation for, you know, talking about them. We talked about eight different things um, that are that are called contradictions that aren't really contradictions. We defined what a contradiction actually is. It's two mutually exclusive statements. They cannot coexist. They are things that cannot both be true. Either Jesus was a man or Jesus was a woman. You can't have both. So um, we will start in Matthew. Um, and there's going to be not, – not all the things that we're going to talk about tonight are, are contradictions – so much as misunderstandings as well. So we're going to try and hit a wide variety of things. Um, Matthew chapter 1 says this, and this is the very first thing, very first verse. Um, it, obviously, this is this is one that is brought up repeatedly in different verses, so I'm going to try and bring them up as much as I can, but this one is just kind of like the very first one. It says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So obviously, there's people who say, well, that that's wrong. He wasn't the son of David. He was the son of Joseph. Well, you can't have both. And it's like, oh my gosh. So basically, um, in these times, they, they understood things a little bit differently, and they used words a little bit differently. So when they say son of, it doesn't have to be direct to descendant. It doesn't have to be like... Um, you personally fathered this person. It could it could be like descent descended from kind of an idea. Um, and th this isn't a, this isn't something where the Bible is wrong. This is something where 
our culture is just a little bit different. And I really wish that people who brought up things like this would do a little bit more work in thinking things through instead of just trying to find something. Remember, how I actually brought this up in, in the lesson two weeks ago. Sometimes people, they, they go to it with the understanding that it's wrong. And so they really can't find the obvious the obvious answer. So the next thing is Matthew chapter 1, verse 8, which says, <clears throat> Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, and Joram fathered Uzziah. So the, the next thing that's brought up is um, um, that they missed one here on this, uh, on this list. Um, they, they, they missed one of the kings. If you go back and look at 1 Chron Chronicles 3.11, which I'll do that right now. says these pages are still sticking I've never read the uh, Chronicles in this Bible so it's a little sticky okay first Chronicles 3 11 says Joram his son Ahaziah his son Joash his son Amaz uh, Amaziah did I miss did I, did I get the right part here Uh, I missed something here. Oh, right there. Yeah, okay, that's what it was. Um, I put the wrong um, the wrong reference there, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll just say both of them. The The first thing that, I, that I'm trying to say is here it says um, you, um, in 1.8, Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, Joram fathered Uzziah, Uzziah fathered Jotham, Jotham fathered Ahaz. So the first thing I want to say is it says, well, one one book says it's Uzziah, the other book says it's Azariah. Well, it's actually the same person, just two different names for them. And then the other point I'm trying to make is that if you compare the, the genealogies, if you compare the genealogies, you see that um, some of the some of the names are missing, and they just kind of skip some of the generations. So the second thing I'm trying trying to bring up is that this is once again where descendant doesn't mean direct descendant. It can mean I mean father of or son of doesn't mean direct. It can mean descendant of or grandchild. Or when it says so and so begat so and so. It can mean fathered or became the ancestor of, not directly. So, like maybe, um, maybe if if it was nowadays, we could say Randy, uh, Randy begot Paul. Well, he he didn't really. See, what I mean, there's just the way that they would do stuff, and they, and they they had reasons for doing that. Sometimes they didn't really want to draw attention to a person, or they wanted to highlight another person. Sometimes they, like for instance, in the book of Matthew, he he had a specific number that he was going for, and so uh, there's a lot of different reasons why a person would do that. Um, the important part to remember is that it's not claiming to be an exhaustive history of the people of Israel. It's only highlighting things that are important for his main point. This is very important because some people go to the books of the Bible like they're all, always supposed to have these things that, you know, everything has to be complete exhaustive history like we do history books now. But that's just that, – that that's asking the wrong thing. It's not lying. It's not, you know, wrong. It's just – limiting information to get us to its main point. Um, okay. Um, so then Matthew 1, 17, and I lost my place in Matthew. Matthew 1, 17 says, um, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. But if you go back and you count the genealogies that he just mentioned, it's not really 14. And the reason for that is because the the guy mentioned here, Jeconiah, um, in verse, where is it? Um, verse 12, after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah fathered Chiltiel. Um, the, the reason why there is is only 13 in the one list and 14 in the other is because Jeconiah accounts for both lists because he lived before and after the exile. So um, Matthew does this in, in a way of counting him 
he, he counts twice to get 14 because he's just trying to get 14. And when, once again, this gene genealogy is abbreviated. It's not meant to be a complete history. He was just trying to get to 14, and once that, that's a conversation for another day. So uh, let's look at Mark chapter 1. The first thing that people bring up, well, Mark doesn't have a genealogy. That, that doesn't make Mark wrong. It means that he excluded it. He also doesn't say anything about the childhood of, uh, of Jesus or the, the circumstances of Jesus' birth. That doesn't make it wrong, it's just Mark has his own reasons for why he's writing things, and Mark tends to be a little bit more concise and short. It's, I believe it's the shortest of the Gospels, and it's um, just real to the point on things. It really doesn't take, its, it doesn't take the scenic route. <coughs> Excuse me. So then um, the next part is a quote that's in the book of, of Mark. It's Mark chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Just as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I am sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way. The voice of one... No. No. The voice of one uh, calling out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Uh, two things he's quoting. One of the passages that he quotes is from the book um, of Isaiah, but the other one that he's quoting from is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And I'll read to you the differences because he changes the wording here, and that, that really bothers some people. So let's just very quickly go to that. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold, I am sending my messenger. Now notice this. Behold, I am sending my messenger, and he will clear a way before me. Okay, now let's go back to Mark. Behold, I am sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way. So that really bothers um, that really bothers a lot of people. Um, two things that bother them. First off, it says in verse 2, just as it's written in, in Isaiah the prophet, but then he quotes Malachi. Well, he quotes Malachi and Isaiah. Um, I, I believe if I'm if I'm remembering correctly that you would give uh, that you would give more uh, what you say, notice, more credence, to the one who's more well-known. So why he mentioned Isaiah and then quoted Malachi and Isaiah. Um, I'm not positive about that one yet. And that one, um, I, I, I haven't haven't reviewed my knowledge. And some of the stuff that I studied, I said years ago. So either way, um, he does quote Malachi. I mean, Isaiah. It's just that he didn't say, Isaiah, said, Isaiah the prophet says this and no other prophet I'm going to quote. He, he doesn't say that. So that's not so much wrong. The same thing is the, the difference of wording. In Mark, it says, I am sending my messenger before you, or in other translations, it says, before your face, who will prepare your way. And whereas in Malachi, it says very clearly, behold, I am sending my messenger, and he will clear a way before me. Um, th the thing is, now, this is this is another thing that kind of hangs people up. When, when you quoted something at the time of, of Jesus... Your quotation didn't have to be exact by word for word. It had to be exact by um, by the understanding of the quote. Okay. The idea was if you're going to quote somebody, you need to understand what the, what, what the point that they were trying to make. And nowadays, we don't think like that. Nowadays, we think word for word. If you're going to quote somebody, it needs to be a precise word for word. I don't care if you get the thought, just that you get the words which causes a lot of problems nowadays. And I, I know a lot of people will say, no, no, they were doing it wrong, we're doing it right. No, I see a lot of people, especially in college, and I'm not pointing at you, I'm saying in college because we both go to college, um, who, what they'll do is they'll quote somebody, but they won't understand what the person was saying, but they'll like the sound of the quote because like, it proves my point. So I'm going to jerk this quote out of context, even though I'm going to keep it word for word so I can ver verify my, my what I'm trying to say. And it's like, well... So you're ragging on people 2,000 years ago because they held the main point that the person was trying to make over the word for word when we <laughs> don't care about what the person was actually trying to say and we just jerk it out of context because we like the wording. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense to me, but whatever. I, it's one of those things where we do things differently now than they did then. That doesn't make it a contradiction. That's just that, you know, whatever. So, um, Mal and the and the and the prophet Malachi, it was written from a different point of view than in the in the book of than in the book of Mark. Mark is trying to point to John the Baptist. He's trying to point to Jesus. 
the prophet was trying to point ahead. So if you go through and, and, and compare Mark 1-2 with Malachi 3-1, you're going to see that the meaning is the same. The wording is slightly different, but the meaning is the same. Mark is just applying it in a different way, and because there's a different point of view, it, it comes out a little bit different. So this one, it, misquoting, he didn't misquote it, he applied what the prophet said. So Luke chapter 1... And next week we're gonna look, we're gonna start looking at the genealogies. There's uh, quite a few uh, problems with the genealogies. If you compare Mark Matthew with Luke, there's problems there. And then if you compare the genealogies with the Old Testament genealogies, there's problems there. So we will be looking at those more in depth. I don't want people to think that that we're I'm just skipping past that. Um, no, I'm definitely not doing that. Um, the genealogies are probably the first occurrence of a legitimate contradiction in the Gospels. So, um, Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26, says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth. So the question being, well, hold on. Um, who who did God talk to first, Mary or Joseph? And the, the thing is, it never actually says. Those are two different Gospels. And Matthew, it records the angel visiting, um, was it Joseph? Hold on. Yes, in Matthew it records the angel going to Joseph, and Luke it records the, go the angel going to Mary. It doesn't say that only one angel went and only one time to one person. It doesn't say that. So this isn't really a, a contradiction. It falls into one of those eight categories that we mentioned two weeks ago where it's just a misunderstanding of what's being said. Mary was evidently Mary. Mary got an angelic vision first before Jerry, before Jerry, <laughs> before Joseph. But um, either she didn't tell Joseph when this angel came to her, or he didn't believe her. We don't know. But either way, it doesn't really factor into the other gospel. One says, "Hey, so this happened to Mary. She knows that she's pregnant." The other one says, um, "Yeah, so her husband was like." The frick is this? <laughs> and you know, so so once again, they they don't contradict they don't contradict each other. They're just different different uh, things that they're highlighting. Um, so either way, they both got their own angelic vision, and it ended up with them being married, but Joseph not having sex with her until after Jesus was born. Um, so uh, then the next. Verse 36 says, And behold, even your relative Elizabeth herself has conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called infertile is uh, now in her sixth month. The contradiction being that how could Elizabeth possibly be her relative because she's of a different tribe than Mary? Well, <laughs> it, I, I'm really surprised that this one is, is so high that people bring up all the time. Related by marriage. It you could marry someone from another tribe. Like I don't understand where the contradiction is on this. It's a, that's probably. I mean, he did. We don't have you know a full genealogy of every single thing, but that seems to me like what's happening. It was it was a relative by marriage. I, I I'm assuming. Which once again you could say, oh well, you're just assuming. And it's like well, you have to assume that 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 the angel got it wrong. That they're not really relatives. Like <laughs> so, which which assumption is is more more reasonable? Um, so then the next one is not really a contradiction so much as a difficulty, and that's should Mary be worshipped or not, or, you know, how, however you want to put that. Some Catholics don't really believe that they're actually worshipping her. So uh, however you want to say that, should Mary be exalted? Um, and it says in 128, uh, we're still in Luke, by the way, uh, and coming in, he said to her, greetings, favor one, the Lord is with you. And from this, you know, we get the Magnificat or whatever the crap it's called, and people kind of just run wild with it. And uh, <laughs> so let's kind of look at that. First off, Mary was a human. Okay, that, 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 that's the first thing to point out. Mary was a human. She was not superhuman. She was not divine. Nowhere in the Gospels does it ever, or anywhere in the Bible, does it ever mention that she was pre-incarnate like Jesus. Never says that anywhere. So I really... I really feel like this is something that's kind of blown out of, out of proportion. The next thing is she had to be sinless in order to give birth to the Christ who was sinless. And it's like, I don't know where you get that. 
it didn't say that the savior would have his mother would also be a savior, like a secondary savior. I don't, I don't know. That, that doesn't even make sense. As far as we can tell, Mary was in fact a sinner. And in fact, there's sometimes when when um, Jesus' divinity is being shown, and she just doesn't really grasp it. If she was somehow more than human, wouldn't she have grasped that, understood it more? <laughs> so anyways, um, it, it says very clearly that she was blessed among women, not over women. It's not like she should be praised over other women. She was favored by God. She, she was used by God in a mighty way. She, you know. So what did she do? I, I don't know. God just, I think, just picked her. Sometimes God's election doesn't really make sense. Like what did uh, Abraham do to earn God's, uh, God's favor of calling him out? Uh, to the promised land. Well, nothing really. <laughs> it it some in fact Paul talks about this in Romans, and I know people get a little bit touchy about talking about this because they don't want to talk about predestination. But still, God's election isn't something that. And you know, I'm not I'm not into predestination, but this is just a fact of how things are when God calls somebody he does it for his own reasons i mean this isn't something that that's up for debate like okay yeah um i i see what you're saying god but let me tell you what i'm saying um the worship of mary ha probably had pagan roots it's, it's hard to say this for sure but we do know as far as i can tell from the earliest of times the christian church did not give mary an exalted place um they there was kind of like a respect thing going on but not so much one of like Woohoo, Mary, you're so big. Can I touch the hem of your garment? Not, not really a thing. Um, it, we do know that there was a lot of, uh, of things with with the pagans, with um, you know, the the queen mother and all these different things. And it's possible that the Catholic Church was like, hey, let's make our own bit of this. And Mary, you're our queen mother now. It, it's it's possible, I, I guess. Um, so Jesus was without sin, but no other person was. Okay. Um, if Mary had to be sinless, then so did Mary's mother. Think about this. So if Mary had to be sinless in order to birth Jesus, then Mary's mother would have had to be sinless in order to birth a sinless Mary so that she could birth Jesus. It doesn't fix the problem. It just moves it further back. But when you say, okay, Jesus used a broken person to accomplish his purposes, that's different. So why didn't he use a broken person to bring a salvation? Because that's impossible. People cannot bring a salvation. So then the next one, John chapter 1, um, these are a series of things that I, I kind of feel are, are more translation issues than anything. So let's, let's look at this. John chapter 1. Okay. So first off, uh, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there, in, in Greek, um, there's no indefinite article. There's a definite article, there's no indefinite article. So you can't just, it, it's not like for a God you put one, and then for the God you put, you know, another. It doesn't really work like that. And to make matters different even more so than how we in English speak, um, the definite article doesn't even have to always be there in a sentence. So, um, the, the, you might you might be saying you, those of you who aren't great at English, you might be saying, "What the heck is a definite article?" <laughs> so, <laughs> let me say it differently. Um, should it be translated, "The word was God" or "The word was a God"? So, if it if it was an indefinite article in English, it would be a God. If it was a definite article in English, it would be and the word was God. Well, in Greek, there is no article at all in this point. So. The question being, should it be translated as a god or the god? Th this is really a misunderstanding of Greek because in Greek, oftentimes, the um, article isn't there when you would think in English it should be there. And it's oftentimes not there. I, you, you know what I'm trying to say. It's not there when you think that it should be and it isn't there when you think – here's a good example. Um, when you say Jesus in Greek, ha, Jesus. So in other words, the Jesus. It doesn't, it's not translated as the Jesus, and it doesn't mean the Jesus. That's just the way that they write. That's how the grammar is. It, it, it's not actually the Jesus, but it looks like the Jesus if you don't know what the heck you're talking about. So there's a few things. First off, it shouldn't be translated as a God because the way that the, that the sentence is structured, it's very clear that he's saying God. And the next thing is the Bible is clear that there are no other gods. 
besides the one. So there's that. The next thing is that Mark chapter 1, verse 3, we just read that, where he was talking about the coming of the Christ. That verse, Mark 1, 3, is a quote from Isaiah, which is talking about the coming of Yahweh, which nobody would argue that Yahweh is the Israelite God. Okay, Nobody would argue that. And so Mark 1, 3 just equated Jesus as being Yahweh. So Mark is trying to prove that he's Yahweh. So then you get to John. John. John argues all throughout his book that Jesus is God. You don't even need John 1, 1 to prove that Jesus is God. You can take that verse out and it's still painfully clear. He says it like 15 different times in a whole bunch of different ways that Jesus is God. I mean, it's just so abundantly clear. Like, that's his main point. It's his thesis statement, if you will. So, uh, you know, it, the whole book of John is arguing that. Um, and then there's the issue that all major Greek translators believe its word was God. You have a hard time finding anybody who says that it's something else unless they're just not real learned in Greek not real educated in Greek, um, or they are a part of a cult where they're just, you know, condoning something because they want to believe their belief. Um, there is no serious translator that, that thinks that this is denying the deity of Jesus. So then the next thing, um, verse 118 uh, says, No one has seen God at any time. God, the only Son, who is in the arms of the Father, he has explained him. So there's a lot of different translations of how this can be, and we're probably going to come back to this later, because you could say, nobody could see God, but then the Old Testament said that they saw God. I'll come back to that probably later at a different time. Basically, what verse 18 is saying is that no living person has seen the Father. Okay, There are people now who have, who have seen the Father because they're not living anymore. Okay, So let's get that clear. No living person has seen the Father. We will one day see the Father. Okay, When people saw God in the Old Testament, they either saw the angel of the Lord, which was standing in the place for God, which in that time, that was um, kind of equivalent as seeing the person. If you were talking to the messenger of the king, it was like you were talking to the king. The person was the voice of the person. A good example of this is in the book of Exodus, where um, God says, I will make you like God to Pharaoh. Well, what is he talking about? You will be my voice. It'll be like he is speaking to me when he speaks to you. And when you are speaking, it's like I am speaking to him. It's the exact same concept. So God, you have, uh, you have this idea that – so God is making it where Moses is like God to Pharaoh, but not that he becomes God. So um, – or the other example would be that they saw Jesus in the Old Testament – and we just didn't have the re the revelation that they were seeing Jesus, um, and that's the way it was. So uh, the next thing um, it says here in one eighteen, um, God the only Son who is in the arms of the Father. Um, another way that translations will say this is the only begotten Son, or um, something along those lines. Begotten is a really bad word to use. When, you, when you're looking at translations. What happened is the King James had only begotten. And so they just kind of stuck with it. They're just like, okay, well, it's, it's law now. So we're going to have this as on throughout the generations, the only begotten Son of God. And it's like, oh, oh my goodness. Begotten more means created in our, English, in our language. Um, but the word means more like special or unique. Okay, um, an example of this would be... Um, uh, that who was it? Um, that Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son, but he wasn't his firstborn son. Ishmael was. Furthermore, um, I already said that he wasn't. He he was not only was he not the only son, he wasn't even the firstborn son. But he was the one that carried the blessing, the the promise. So he was his special, unique son. Does that kind of make sense? And then he had kids after Isaac as well. But the Bible still talks about. Abraham's son Isaac in those same words. So um, Jesus was the special, unique son of God. Um, he's, he wasn't the only son of God because we're all sons of God, right? And he wasn't the only begotten because he was never begotten. So some ways of contra contrasting his sonship to our sonship, 
which I know that there's girls here. I understand that. I'm, I'm trying to simplify here. Sonship and daughtership. <laughs> he has no, be no beginning. Jesus has not had a beginning. We do have a beginning. So that's, first off, not son as we think. Next, he is the creator. We are the created. That's that's the next next big difference there. No other one of God's sons has the power that Jesus has. It says he's the exact imprint of the Father. So there's that. Um, next off, Jesus has the exact nature of God, and we do not have. Oops, and we do not have the exact nature of God. We are adopted in. He is God for all time, in the past, eternity, and the future eternity. He is God. We have been adopted in as sons. So then the question becomes, so why even use the term son? Well, there's actually a huge debate. I'll save you most of it. This is this is the, the idea here, okay? Is Jesus eternally the son of God? Or is he called the son of God because he, he was the one, of the part of the Trinity that was chosen to be born of the Virgin Mary, thus being born of God, thus being the son of God? So is he called the Son of God because of a, a an action that he took, becoming human? Or is he called the Son of God because of his eternal existence as, quote-unquote, Son? My belief is that he's called the Son of God because he chose to be born of the Virgin Mary, that he's not the eternally, et eternally the Son. Okay? The reason why I think that is because how can, you, how can he be eternally the Son? That, that doesn't even make sense. You know, it, it's like it's like in the in the psalm where he says, "Today I have begotten you," or, or I, I mean, I forget the exact word that he says, but today I have done this thing. How could he how could he choose a day, setting it as today, if Jesus was eternally the Son? How could that be a thing? That doesn't make sense. But when you say, "Okay, so Jesus was before he was Jesus, before he was born, he was still the second person of the Trinity, eternally existent with the Father." So he was Yahweh, okay? And so then when he was born, well then he was a son then he was a son of a son of God. Now, people will disagree with me. I totally get that. I I just don't see any reason for believing that. A lot of the church fathers believed that he was eternally um, begotten. Um, so there is historical claim to that belief. It's just not one that I believe. Um, okay, so some some contradictions. Now we can actually get to get to real contradictions if we aren't too. Well, we're getting kind of late. Ah, it's okay. John one thirty three says this. It says unless is it? Do you guys want to stop there? No, you can keep going. Okay. All right. John one thirty three says, uh, and I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in, in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so he just said he didn't know him. John's talking about Jesus, and he said, "I didn't know the guy." But then you get to, you look over at Matthew three, and this is one of the, one of the examples that I was talking about a legitimate um, contradiction. Matthew chapter three says, "Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him." But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me? Clearly, he knows him. So we have a little bit of a contradiction. John says, hey, I didn't know the guy. Matthew says, hey, I knew the guy. So, you know, this is, well, what's the, what's the answer? Well, surprisingly, it's a lot simpler than we make it. He didn't, he knew Jesus from when he was a kid, physically. But he didn't grasp that he was the, that he was the Messiah until this part in John where he looks over and God reveals to him and says, if you, if you look at the way it's worded in John 1.33, he actually makes that pretty clear. He says, and I did not recognize him. I didn't, I didn't understand who he was. But he who sent me, the, when God, God who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So he didn't have real recognition of who Jesus was. It wasn't like they were kids together and he was all, ha ha, you're going to be the Messiah. He had no idea. But here at this point, he's baptizing in the water. Jesus comes up. He sees the Holy Spirit descending on. And God's like, this is the one. And he's like, oh, this is the one we've been waiting for. He was right there the whole time. So... Um, that seems to be the most obvious way, obvious translation, by the way, that it says that he didn't recognize him. So, 
Next contradiction. John 1, 37 through verse 49, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it talks about here how Jesus calls some of the disciples. Uh, and the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus, and Jesus turned and saw them following and said to him, what are, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translates means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they uh, stayed with him that day. It was about the tenth hour. Excuse me. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He, he, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. So here, if we compare this with Matthew, you're going to see another obvious con contradiction here. Matthew chapter uh, 4, verse 18 through 22, it says, did I do that right? Yeah. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee. What? That's not what John said. We have two contradictions of how the disciples were first called. Well, then it gets a little more complicated, and I've put all the scripture references, but I'm just going to go ahead and make it real simple, okay? And John, that's how he first met those disciples. That's not when he called them. And if you look and read the story, it very clearly says that he did not say, yes, come with me now. It says that they stayed with him that day. Okay? Then Ma Matthew and the others don't tell us how they met. It just says that he walked up to them and said, okay, come on. This is when they're actually when he's actually calling them. So then the next thing to point out is that in one of the Gospels, I don't know if I have it written down in the, in the references here or not, but he says, um, P Peter, who is called Cephas, okay, or who Jesus called Cephas. What he that he that's not when he called when he changed Peter's name. He changed Peter's name right here at the beginning when he fr very first met him. He saw him and said, "You're Cephas. You, you, you're rock." And then later, and then later he comes, to, he comes to this part where he gives meaning to it. So Peter says, "You are the Christ," and he says, "People didn't show this to you. The Holy Spirit did." Now, and I'll tell you this: you are a rock, and upon this rock. See, now he gives him the the reason for why he called him rock. So this is this is what it looks like chronologically. Okay, P Jesus meets Peter. He says, "I'm going to name you Rock," and Peter's like. Okay, because my name's Simon, but okay. So then he leaves, and he's like, okay, well, that's something. And then he meets him again and says, okay, come on with me. He's like, okay, cool, I guess I'm going to be your disciple now. That's kind of cool, which some of the disciples were actually disciples of John the Baptist, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so he starts following him, and then later, you know, and, and all the Gospels keep alluding to it. Uh, Simon, who is called Peter? Okay, why is that relevant? And then later he says, hey, you are the Christ. He says, this is why I've called you rock, because upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome. And he's like, why didn't you tell me that three years ago? <laughs> but anyways, um, so in other words, John gives us more of a foretelling of what's going to be going on in Peter's life, and the other gospels just kind of boop, skip over that. Um, so this is not a contradiction. This is two different historical events. Easy to easy to mistake. John's passage is not where they become his disciples, but rather where they meet him. So the last thing I want to look at tonight is there's this bit where um, Jesus' early life, and it seems like the Gospels contradict where Jesus came from and all that stuff. So I have done the task, and you are welcome, of going through the Gospels and tracing Jesus' steps all the way up until his wedding miracle in John. Okay? So, you're welcome. Starts off, Mary is engaged to Joseph. They're in the city of Nazareth. Okay? Then they go to Bethlehem to be counted in a census. While they are at Beth Bethlehem, shepherds come to them. The, the, the angels go to, go to the shepherds in the field, and they're like, hey, the Christ, right, right there. And they're like, well, let's go check this out. So they, they go to Bethlehem. That's when the, when the shepherds get there, okay? Um, it li it's very likely that the shepherds were there on the very night of his birth, okay? Next off, 
they made trips every single year to Jerusalem to be circumcised. It's not clear whether they were living in Bethlehem at that point. It doesn't say. We just know that they were taking trips to Jerusalem. It makes sense that they were still living in, in Bethlehem at that time because of what happens next and because they, ma they made the trip to Jerusalem, which was not very far from, from Bethlehem. It was just a couple miles away. So that, that all makes sense. So I'm assuming that they were at Bethlehem this whole time. So they go to Jerusalem to be circumcised on his eighth day as the, as the Jewish law uh, required. Sometime after this, we don't know exactly when. The Magi from the east come to see him, and they're still in Bethlehem. So maybe they were still there before they went home. Maybe they were just like, okay, well, we just bore the, we just birthed this child, and we need to have him circumcised in Jerusalem. Let's kind of just hang out for a couple days. So then they go. The baby's circumcised, and they're like, let's not travel with this baby who's just circumcised. That's going to be disastrous. So then while they're staying there, the Magi come. Maybe. Maybe they were there for family on another trip. Maybe they had temporarily moved there. I don't know. Either way, they're in Bethlehem when the Magi, come, when the Magi get there. Um, the Magi leave, and God tells the Magi, don't go back to Herod. I'm like, okay, whatever. We don't really care. And so then God visits Joseph in a dream and says, Herod's about to kill like a bunch of kids two years and under. That tells me that that took about two years for the whole story from the Magi and the Herod thing to happen. That's what that tells me, unless he's just like a sadist, and he's like, he's probably two months old, but I will kill two years old, like, which he was a psycho. He definitely was a psycho. He he, he killed some of his own family, and it just, he was a psycho. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm not I'm not arguing against that. He definitely could have just randomly killed two years and older just to kill them. Um, either way. Um, God tells them in a, dream to, in a dream to go to Egypt. So he, so they do. They go from Bethlehem to Egypt, and they're there for a number of years until Herod dies. And but then uh, God tells them to go back. Herod's dead, so they they start heading back. But they're scared to return to Bethlehem in, in Judea because Herod's son is there, and they're like, this is not going to be great. So God tells them, okay, go to Nazareth instead. So. They don't go back to Bethlehem, they go back to Nazareth. And it was in Nazareth where Jesus was raised, which is why the disciples say, can anything good come from Nazareth? And the other disciple says, well, come and see. <laughs> Instead of sitting here arguing with me, why don't you just go look? Um, so then they still made the trip of going to Jerusalem every year, which is where we find Jesus being 12 in the temple, and his parents left him, but they already established the fact that that Jesus's family made the made the yearly trek into Jerusalem, so that that's nothing new there. Um, and then the next time we pick up on him was is before um, he has his public ministry. He's at a he's at a wedding feast in Cana. Nothing to do with his ministry, and he turns the water into wine. So um, and that's in and, and then his time at the Jordan. And so on and so forth from there. So chronologically, that is this that is the that is Jesus' route as a kid. Now I I, I you are welcome because it, I I always had questions about this and I was like, what the crap is going on? And you know it seems like it's a huge contradiction. Was he from Bethlehem or was he from Nazareth or was he from Jerusalem? Well now you know. So there's that. Um, the genealogies contradict each other, and we'll look at that. Um, they contradict each other in a big way. So we're definitely going to look at that um, next week. Um, and also there's an issue with the census where um, the issue, where the census isn't when the Bible said that it was. So we will look at that as well. Um, but that will have to be for next week. We've already gone for 40 minutes. Wow. So uh, any questions or comments? We're all good? I had a comment uh, about – Comment away. Well – I, I, in regards to the belief about Jesus eternally being the Son, mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, he's he's I believe that he's always been like the Son. He, he didn't like become that like when he was born mm -hmm. because when we baptize people, we're still we're supposed to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that's after that's after he you know rose from the grave and. Mm -hmm. Ascended, and then also um, in John, I think it says that uh, the Father loved him before the foundation of the world. So right now, 
with that being said, now hold on, let me let me give my rebuttals. Now I'm not trying to dissuade you. I'm just defending my own my own view. Okay, so it's totally fine that you believe that. I'm definitely not trying to trying to persuade you from that. Um, as far as I can see, we have we have historical claims in Christianity for both beliefs. So as far as I can tell, it wasn't ever resolved, and people the Catholic Church went just went eternally exist eternally begotten. Because they just went. I don't. I don't know why they did that. That was just the view that they went. So um, th first off, I, I never said that he was not um, eternally exalted with the Father and was not eternally eternally God. Right. right. That, that's totally that. I, I. So that second thing that you said doesn't discredit my my opinion. It's it's just yes that that the Father and the Son had an eternal relationship because they were both eternally God. Yeah. So I'm totally not disagreeing with that. But if you look in um, a lot of the Bible, it talks about the way that he – let me kind of reword it for the sake of my argument. That he earned a glory when he went up to the Father. Well, what could he have possibly earned unless he did something that he hadn't done before? Now, obviously, obviously the answer being he became the Son. He wasn't always born of the Virgin Mary. So the next thing is the thing that you that, – what was the first part you said uh, about – the, uh, but baptism, like, oh, baptism, yes. Before Jesus came, people were being baptized, and they were not being baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then there's a second thing that in the book of I believe it's Acts, he doesn't say baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says baptize them in the name of, the, of, the, of, of, of Jesus, in the name of the Son. So um, that's not a, um, what's it called, um, a, a command to do it in that way, so much as to do it according to that person. Which once again takes us back to the cultural setting. Um, not that you have to say when you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because like I say, there's other parts where they baptize just according to the name of, of yeah. So that tells us that it, it's not um, that's not like the formula, the right formula. And anybody that doesn't do like that, they're wrong. Um, but that command was given after Jesus was already had already died and was resurrected, which then at that point he would have been the Son. So it made sense to baptize according to the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Once again, not trying to dissuade you. It's just that that seems more like a chronological issue because Jesus didn't give that command before he died and was resurrected. He gave it after he was, after. After he was resurrected. So I really don't feel like that um, discredits my belief. But like I say, I mean, th this is an argument. This is why I just kind of skipped over it is because this argument has been going on for like thousands of years. And if you read the different church fathers like they all had their own personal belief on it and they you know so it's like well which group do you align yourself with and i'm like eh, whatever yeah i mean if, if you believe that whatever it's fine it's, it's not gonna like keep you from heaven it's not gonna yeah. keep you get you saved <laughs> there's gonna be there's gonna be things that we just don't understand until we're in heaven and then we're like ah okay all right now, if you if you believe that jesus wasn't god then that, that's right really a but that's a whole different that's a whole, that's a whole different conversation yeah right. okay well, I think we're all done then. Unless anybody had anything else?